Coming to you live from the Stream.TV studios in Hollywood, California, Pensado's Place is brought to you by Vintage King, The Recording Connection, and The Blackbird Academy. We have got a true rock god coming to you from the south of France. We've got a bunch of updated information. We've got a brand new ITL. We just brought a basket of goodies, right? Oh, yes, yes. You are at the place. It's Pensado's place. Yay! <laughs> Bonjour, madame, whatever guys are in <laughs> French. <laughs> Uh, man, great to have you. We're gonna Madame have a, and Monsieur. Yeah, we're gonna have a great time. Uh, uh, one, one, a person I really respect his work a lot. We're gonna talk with him and get to know him a little better. Uh, absolutely. How are you, man? man? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. How was um, the week? The week has been great. Yeah. Um, on a number of levels, you know, the the award show is starting to really formulate and solidify, and yeah. that's pretty exciting. It's scary, but exciting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, Thanks to you guys, you put a lot of pressure on us, and we we can handle it. But ooh, ooh back's hurting a little. <laughs> <laughs> How's your week been? Uh, same, um, you know. You do realize we're midweek, and we're talking about the entire week as if we. Right. So I'm not even sure what time frame we're talking about, <laughs> but nonetheless, by the time they see it, um, you know what? It's it's all good and all humbling, and yeah. you know I think we just keep our head down and move forward. Correct. Yeah. No. I mean. Um, a lot of this is new to me from the from from the perspective of of your chair because mm -hmm. you 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 do so much in the show. Um, I show up Mac Dumb a couple of times a week. Not and, really, but and and, and um, I'm really enjoying seeing how this is coming together. We've got a, an incredible team. Ooh. The teamwork from the team is spectacular, and um, every and, day it's a new surprise, you know. And they made it happen. I mean, the the initial uh, ability certainly having to do with the the Pensado Awards, the support from our audience literally put that team in place and and you know how we are mm -hmm. we want to bring that back to them in bucket loads and so we'll take that risk and hang it out there there's more of that to come but i must say that with you i in casting a critical eye i'm pretty impressed so far mm -hmm. um you know we got to we got to get there but but it's pretty impressive shall we tell them about it do it so Hey gang, another week in audio has prevailed. Sincerely <laughs> hope it was good for you. If not, this week will be better. We promise you that. Trust us on that. Um, your likes and subscribes are so awesome. That gesture literally powers our show. Uh, Team Pensado is super grateful for that. We continue to grow literally because of you. As you view this, it's the top of April. Um, a big month on a number of fronts for us. Coming soon, a refreshed website with more info, features, and opportunities directly to you. We're also going to refresh a few things on the show. Um, we've got a, a bunch of killer guests who both want to be on and we want to get. We're going to get updated graphics going. We're going to get more content. We'll tell you, we'll tell you about that stuff. Uh, Dave has shot some great new ITLs. Will Thompson has some details about upcoming guests on the site. More stuff there. The Pensado Award momentum is moving like crazy, actually kind of stunning, really. Um, we'll get to some of those details in a second. Plus, uh, probably next week, if not the week after, we'll have some important sponsor announcements. A whole bunch of stuff is going on. <laughs> oh, by the way, footnote, yeah. uh, just give me a stick of deodorant. It doesn't qualify as my refresh. It's going to okay, have to no. be a little better than that. Cologne, well, please. Well, and also because of the challenge of the deodorant. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so all that soon to come, very, very soon to come. Uh, speaking of sponsors, Vintage King, our brothers from another mother. Uh, we're excited about our discussions. Mm -hmm. We're going to come to Detroit and talk to the team, and we got a lot that we'll unveil in a second. Our Nashville family, some more brothers from another mother and sisters. Uh, the Blackbird Academy got on the phone with Will and I last week, laid out their goals to us for the next six months. And I'm telling you, this will be very opportunistic for you when we roll it out. Provided you're really serious, serious about your career, serious about audio, you will want to take full advantage of these opportunities. You, you know, for us, this is the house of excellence. They cut no corners. And when you come out of that school, you are ready to roll. You're going to be employed. <laughs> um, and then there's a the recording connection, boys, learning where you live. Um, in discussions with them, we're going to unpack that whole methodology 
and do some some shows on how that yeah. works and what the process is and all that stuff. All coming soon. And then finally on this thing that's consumed us since you know the holidays, uh, the Pensado Awards. Couple of notes and dates, pay attention here. On April 12th, as we discussed last week, 10 a.m. Pacific time, Dave and I and a couple of our pros will be doing the Google Hang with all of the producers who have committed and supported us. We will get your input and suggestions on categories. We'll review the categories that Dave and I have already pre-selected. We'll add your best ideas. We'll all finalize that on that Google Hang. We'll be ready to roll. Once that's done, then we'll get to the next step, which will be the nominees, and we'll announce that process soon. A couple things upcoming. Uh, we hope to announce the host of the Pensado Awards in the next week or so. Uh, I'm having some very encouraging conversations, and Dave and I are very excited about that. Ye this week, <laughs> I went to a production meeting to sort of oversee the details of the show and look at the facility. Mm -hmm. Right about the time when my production guy said, where can I park the semi? Ooh. That, that's when I fainted. <laughs> with, what? The semi? What does that cost? <laughs> so, wow. I, I know, Dave, I, where this is going. So, look, I, provided we get it all done, I'm telling you, it's going to be a great time. The Fairmont where we're having it is off the hook. The party next door to where we're having it is next door. Next door is 10 feet away. Um, it's elegant, it's cool, but we are gonna just shake some booties and melt some mascara. One of the things that's different about our awards show is the awards part of the show and the party part of the show uh -huh. are, are, are part of the one unit. No they, doubt don't, about they don't disconnect. No. You don't go to the awards show and then party. The awards show starts the party and the party party is the part. It's Ab like, absolutely, it's a lot of peas. We wanna have some fun. We're gonna have some fun. And, it's a and, celebration. And, it's a celebration to you guys. Um, you, um, and to that, to that aim, New link alert, new link alert. Now you can go to PensadoAwards.com for info and details on the big night. We'll have hotel options for you so you can spend what you need to spend and stay with inside your budget. That's going to be a new place for you to go to to get a bunch of information. So PensadoAwards.com for up-to-date info. FundAnything.com forward slash Pensado if you still want to contribute. We have about 10 days before, at least of this taping on the 2nd, about 10 days before the producer hangs, so if there's anybody who still wants to contribute. Will Thompson is monitoring both of those websites, and he's there to answer all of your questions. And when I was in the space yesterday, I was like, we got to fill this boy up because it's just going to be fun. So we really want to mm. see you there. Um, if they don't know, this, this it's right on the beach. And right on the, the beach, The auditorium man. holds, what, two, three million people? Yeah, two, three million. And so it's pretty big. And... Um, We've got one light on our light show. Precisely. Precisely. <laughs> one handheld mic. <laughs> and it's going to be a party. <laughs> no, I tell you what, you mentioned the staff earlier. They they are all pros in their respective categories, and, and this thing's going to be the real deal. Yeah. It, cost wise and everything. Oh, boy. Uh, but you but, know what? But you blessed us. It's going to be fun. We're going to bless it wait. back. Yeah, it's going to be a bunch of fun. So you got all that information. Follow up. Review this. Stay in touch with us. Let's rock it. Dave, why don't you introduce this week's ITL? Oh, um, this week's Into the Lair, I'm, I'm showing how to use some saturation to increase the upper harmonics on a bass so you can find it in the mix. I thought it was kind of cool. Check it out. Okay, recently I was working on a bass guitar and I, I needed a little more of the, the fret noise, the finger noise, to get a little top end on it so it would cut through the mix a little better. And let me show you what I ran into. Right around 1K or so, it just vaporizes. It just a couple of K, it, it, there's just no high end to get. So what I did was I duplicated the track. And here's the duplication. I, um, I kept a couple of the plugins. I added, I took, I took everything above 500 out. And uh, I left some of this stuff on because I thought it added some nice color. Added a little bit of... Um, Luster harmonics from uh, Dave Hill, Crane Song, cool plug-in. 
And so I've created and generated some high-end harmonics with max bass. Let me show you this. This is without this is without any of my processing. So this is with max bass. Now it's generating some harmonics you can't hear. So now I just took a, a, a UAD high frequency enhancer and um, check this out. Okay, nothing. With my stuff, all I'm trying to get is some high end information. Now, let's add that back into our original track. This is without it. I'm exaggerating a little bit for you. Another example, let's just try one little section. Sometimes it's easier for me to hear it that way. So that helps your ear find it in the mix, and you can apply this to uh, instead of instead of using something that low, you can do the same thing with a, a dull vocal, but use but add in some high frequencies uh, from the uh, harmonic enhancers that you're using. You can do it with mid range on the guitar. I got a feeling this would sound great on guitars too. This ex same exact setting, it'd probably help it cut. You know, it might help some background vocals cut. On background vocals, I don't like to keep as much top end on the backgrounds as I've got on my lead because then my my lead doesn't have a place to sit because it's got all this information around it that's competing for the same high frequencies. So sometimes I, I, I move my EQ points a little lower on backgrounds, like say the, the, the highest frequency you'll hear is like six or seven, and I emphasize the mid-range so it can kind of have a place to sit with the lead vocal. But lots of uses for this, and um, I used it on a bass and it sorted it out, straightened out the problem really well. Next time. Hey guys, make sure you use that ITL. Go back and reference it. I'm sure there's some good stuff in there. Good mm -hmm. job, David P. Thank you. Uh, from my perspective, one of the things that's always fun is when we have a guest that Dave gets really excited about. And I will tell you, we have been talking about this guest yeah. for probably three or four months. Our good friend Victor, who is uh, one of the chieftains of a great program in the south of France right. called Mix with the Masters, mm -hmm. um, we periodically talk about doing things together, do some things together. Mm -hmm. You've been invited to come over. Yeah, I'm definitely going. And they have incredible, talented producers and engineers come over, and you get an immersive boot camp for a couple of weeks in a beautiful facility where I think both the teacher and the students kind of learn from each other. Yeah. It's, it's super unique. Yeah. And uh, coming to us by Skype from that beautiful place is the incredible Chad Blake. Chad, how are you, man? I'm good. Good, Chad, good. Good, 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 good. Thank you for uh, making the time for us. Hope we're not taking away from some students who are, who are pissed because they paid money. <laughs> oh, no, no, they're, they're all ti we're, they're tired out eating, drinking. Cool, cool, cool. They're having some wine, some, some yeah. bread, some, some French bread and stuff. DP, fire away. Chad, uh, one of the things that, that of many that, that I enjoy about your work is you never repeat yourself. It's like every record is unique and, and you have a different approach for every record. Um, you you got to be fearless to do that. Like, like a lot of us mere mortals, we tend to repeat a few things just mainly if nothing else for the speed of it. What's your philosophy on, on your approach to records from that perspective? I, I, I'm not sure I view it the same way you're viewing it. I'm, uh, I think I repeat myself quite often. 
Um, you know, I'm, I'm using the same gear I used t 20 years ago, although I've, I've gone to plugins now. I'm not using analog stuff, but I'm still kind of using, I still use a Sans amp as a plug-in. Um, so uh, I, I don't know. I think it's, uh, maybe I get to work with a lot of different artists. I've been really lucky in that regard, and the sounds just come up different. You know, different instruments react different ways. So uh, maybe out there it sounds a lot different um, varied, but uh, I kind of feel like I do the same stuff over and over. <laughs> <laughs> hey man, I know you get this question a, a million times a day, but um, are you still working pretty heavily with uh, binaural heads and in binaural mode to record live instruments and stuff? Uh, not as much as I used to. I used to do a lot of field recording uh, for real world, and um, I, I used to use the mic a, a, a bit more than I do now. I, I don't record so much. I've, I've really sort of settled into mixing. I live out in the country, uh, pretty deep in the country. And um, so I'm just mixing. Uh, but I've always used it for my overheads. Um, I mean, since ooh, the early 90s, it became my overhead mic, and I've just never gone back. Uh, there's a story about you doing a binaural recording, and, and, and you, were, you had I don't know if it's true, but the urban mythology of this story goes that you were, you had some lavalier mics taped in your ears and you bent over by a guitar amp and you were recording the guitar and then you were like moving your head from side to side periodically. Is that true? Yeah, we were doing that today. <laughs> How cool is that? Um, I don't know it's, that much it's anymore, uh, just today. <laughs> no, it's, it's trying, um, trying to incorporate some binaural, uh, you know, it, it, it it actually isn't binaural anymore when you start putting it into like another uh, field, into stereo mixing. But uh, it's a nice way to pan things. If I want to pan a guitar, I can run like a lead guitar out through a speaker, go out, put these uh, microphones in my ears, and I can move around the speaker and get uh, a really random, crazy panning uh, that I can mix into the, to the mix. So that's what, that's what you heard about. That's so cool. I wonder, if, I wonder. I guess we could make a plug-in. Somebody could make a plug-in to kind of emulate that, much like MS can be emulated with a plug-in. Anyway, I digress. <laughs> are, are you still trying to get most of your ambience and your reverb from the recording itself, and not try to use too many outside reverb sources, be them uh, digital or analog? Yeah, I'm still pretty reverb light, but I've, I've. Uh I've gotten better at it. The only reason I didn't use reverb back in the day was um, I was so lousy at it. I, I, d I really didn't know how to fit it in. So I'm a bit of a contrary cuss. So I just went the other way and went dry. Hmm. Um, on, on, on the Arctic Monkeys, Monkeys song, um, do I want to know, was, was that drums only? Did you use some reverb on that song? Or, did, or is it just strictly the the ambience you were given with the drum kit. Yeah, I don't remember uh, adding any, any reverb to, uh, to drums. I don't, I don't often add reverb to drums. I'll use their ambience or I'll use uh, my distortion or uh, you know, some parallel compression, but some really crunchy distorting compressors that end up sounding like it. Uh, you know, I can put them on the overheads and then the overheads become my room mics. Too cool. I want to, I want to remind our viewers that um, even though, even though we, we won't talk a lot about the Black Keys, um, Chad won two Grammys for the Black Keys, and that's, that's, that could be my favorite record of, of his, although there's so many going way back. And um, the Arctic Monkeys uh, AM record is another one of my favorites, but he's also done Pearl Jam and Fish and a lot of stuff. Uh, Chad. Fish, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I like that record. Yeah. Um, it feels to me like, like you're using um, some distortion plugins these days. Um, what's your go-to distortion plugin? Uh, my favorite is still Sans Amp. I, it's the PS1, I think, is what it's labeled in, in Pro Tools. I, I, I think it's a brilliant plugin. I love it. I use Decapitator. Um, you know, I'll use the uh, radiator, uh, Sound Toys radiator sometimes. But I think. Uh, Sans amp is the thing I'm most comfortable with. If, if I have to choose one, it's going to be that. On, um, on Are You Mine on the Arctic Monkeys, did you use uh, Decapitator on that lead vocal? Can, I know this uh, is unfair to ask these questions. That was like no, two no. years ago. Um, 
Uh, it wasn't that long ago, actually, but I'm terrible at remembering this stuff. You know, I put stuff on and just move, you know, I, I don't really remember. But, you know, I think you might be right, because I think I did use quite a bit of um, Decapitator on, on the vocals on that record. Well, I'm going to call that a yes. Yeah. Um, when I first started uh, knowing about your work, you were, you were uh, not in the box, and... And you've kind of morphed over and, and learned how to make that process adapt to your philosophies of music. Are, are you still pretty comfortable being in the box these days? I think I'm more comfortable, yeah. If, uh, I find there's a, a bit of a learning curve for me to come back. Uh, we, we were tracking today. I was showing um, the, the guys here uh, just the way I used to track in the analog uh, world without a tape machine. I was going to Pro Tools. But um, I am. I'm more comfortable in Pro Tools now. I, I really love it. Um, there's there's drawbacks, but there's drawbacks with everything. Um, but uh, I, I I don't I think if I had a lot of money and I had could set up a studio, I'd have both. I'd have tape, an analog desk, Pro Tools, and I, it would just be the mood of the day. What what I decided, you know, this song maybe this will be this song will sound good on analog. Let, let's do it that way. Um, but uh, I've got a little studio at home in the middle of Wales and. Uh, you know, I've, Pro Tools is the only thing that's going to fit in there. <laughs> but, but what did you do with your collection of, uh, I'm being kind, I'm not trying to be a jerk, but uh, your collection of musical junk artifacts and things yeah. nobody wants anymore. What did you do with that collection of, of the steel pipes that are tuned and all, all the things that you're known for? How did they fit oh, in I that still, little studio? I still have, I still have got all the junk that nobody wants because nobody still wants it. Um, but uh, I've sold a lot of the, the, you know, the vintage stuff, like uh, I had some Neve modules, I had LA-3As, um, uh, I had uh, API EQs, rack of API EQs and pre's, and um, yeah, I, I had a fair amount of stuff, uh, and I got rid of all that. I'm really happy with uh, a lot of the plugins these days, I really, um, you know, it's different. They're, I don't think they're ever going to sound the same, but I, I don't care. Sometimes they sound better, sometimes uh, better and worse are not really sh applicable, are they? Because it's just the application that determines the value of something. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. Uh, a long time ago I read you say something, and I'm paraphrasing because I can't remember it, but, but um, I thought you said something like flat is boring or I don't like flat and, and that uh, 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 a little color is a good thing or I want color in my in my uh, equipment, uh, when you pick up a piece of equipment, you, you, you still want that color. You don't want to. Yeah. You don't want to come back what you gave it. You want something better, right? That's right. Uh, a flat microphone wouldn't do me any good. Can you explain that? Well, um, I, I think vocals are a great way to explain it. Um, if you're doing vocals with drums and electric guitars, uh, a vocal's not really built to sit on top of all that and it often needs help, and um, EQ, like you can use EQ. Uh, EQ does funny things, though, we, we all know. Um, at microphones, using proximity effect with a, a, a good um, you know, dynamic or condenser uh, cardioid, and, and being able to use that proximity effect to actually get some chestiness or low end that will sit on top of big drums or big guitars, I think is essential. You know, that takes me to a point. Um, my friend Alex DeYoung uh, asked me to ask you this question. He's a big fan. Um, I'm paraphrasing, Alex. Your, your mixes are, are, are very dense and, and, a, and a bit complex a lot of times, but you find room for the clarity and, for, and, and how to retain the clarity. You, what you just described in terms of, of the color in a vocal mic competing with the guitars, is that part of this process to keep things dense but clear? I, I, I don't know if I framed that question exactly right, but... Yeah, um, I'm not sure. I'm, um, I don't really think or analyze it very much. I just want things to sound good to my ear. Um, so I play with it. I carve frequencies out, uh, use different mics, have the vocalist be closer or farther away from the mic. Same as, you know, moving a mic in on a guitar amp or pulling it away uh, for, you know, as, as your first stage in EQ, really. Um, and uh, and that all does contribute absolutely. Your your one of your gifts is to take uh, a group of songs 
and connect them in an album format. The album format isn't as popular popular as it used to be. How are you getting that that out of your system these days? Well, I don't really. Um, it's uh, yeah, it, uh, that's a little bit of a problem. I still like records. I think all us old dogs do, you know. Um, and it's it is. It's a bit of a, 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 a moot point now these these days. But I still listen in terms of it being an album, but most of the time, I'd say 99% of the time when I mix a record, I don't know the, what the sequence is going to be, and I, I have no input on the sequence. So, uh, I mean, that's, you know, why I need a good mastering engineer, right? Um, is, is really that. That's, for me, that's uh, the main reason to have a mastering engineer is to, is to make that, those mixes flow. I, I agree, gotcha. Um, uh, in terms of your skill set, you're, you're an accomplished guitar player, mixer, engineer, producer. Uh, are you are you finding yourself at this part of your career still enjoying all of those equally, or is one kind of taking the forefront in terms of your enjoyment? Um, well, I'm, uh, I'm, I don't think I'm that accomplished a guitar player actually, but I am. Um, I don't do that very much. I'll, I'll play guitar on something. If I can't get a mix and there's, uh, I, I can't work out what's, what's wrong with the song, um, from a mix standpoint, I'll add a guitar or I'll add percussion or drums. I've got all the instruments at home and I can do little bits and pieces. Uh, and I, I still, I love doing that if the artist is okay with it. Most of them are. Um, uh, I've, I've really gotten into mixing, and there's a lot of reasons I like mixing. It's just fun to sit and contemplate uh, what you're going to do with a mix. And, uh, and, and it's a journey from start, from start to finish. I never know where it's going to go. I'm pretty, you know, uh, willy-nilly. When, when I start going, I just want to catch my wave, and, and two hours later I'll go, oh, uh, here I, hey, that sounds pretty good. Or, Sometimes I think it sounds like shit, so uh, I'll start over. But um, I like it for that reason. I really like mixing. I like mixing in the box because it's very convenient. Um, and I'm, I have my kids, my family at home. We're, we homeschool our boys. Uh, so it's, um, I get to stay home. I can mix. You know? That's nice. I think, uh, I think the California state government requires me to put a footnote in here to you young engineers starting out. It might be a little to your advantage to have a plan and not quite follow that yet. That's a very pro <laughs> technique. It could be dangerous. I'm not sure Pro Tools is certified to work that way. It could cause a lot of problems. So be careful at home. You support that concept, right? Yeah, yeah. Don't try this at home. This is. <laughs> hey, Chad, I, I got a question for you. What, what was some of the magic, or continues to be the magic, when you and Mitchell Froome would get together? Is it different skill sets? Is it chemistry? It does it just inspire you creatively? What was, what, what's, what, what is behind that collaborative process for you? Oh, well, that's, um, he, he, you know, I could just about say he taught me everything I know, really. Um, and, and not that he was new about engineering or, um, that he, he taught me specifically or directly about gear or anything. But his arrangement skills, I still think, uh, uh, I, I love him. Uh, I, I love what he, he does arrangement-wise. And it was only because of that that I was able to do what I wanted to do. I, I was doing some of this stuff before I met him, distorting things and heavily compressing and reamping stuff. And I mean, we all were. It's been going on for decades. But um, it wasn't uh, really until I started working with him and he looked at it and we decided to work together and uh, he left me all the space I could ever hope for at, you know, and, and created space for some of it, you know, a lot of it. We, we often on this show, <clears throat> and even with some of our sponsors, um, talk about how that one-to-one -one relationship, when it's the right relationship, you, you almost can't get a better situation mm -hmm. than that so that you feel comfortable, you can grow, expand yourself, yeah. try things, fail keep moving, right? But, but you have to no, find yeah. that right, safe place I agree. to go. In fact, in fact to put a, a, an exclamation point or, uh, on, on what Chad just said, 90% of what I learn as a mix engineer, I learn from other producers mm -hmm. because producers don't know that they should do or shouldn't do certain things and you get a lot of good ideas that way from... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, Chad, um, 
I'm fascinated by your guitar sounds, being a guitar player, and I'm also an aficionado of uh, guitar pedals. On, on the guitars on Are You Mine on the Arctic Monkeys, um, is, that, is that an example of, of some of the mangling that you just described that you learned from Mitchell? It came really well recorded, beautifully arranged, and uh, it was like a, a gift, you know, <laughs> and they wanted me to mix it. It was great. All I feel that I did on that record was extend the bottom and the top a bit. Uh, and, you know, I, I still add my sans amp in there on the kick drum and snare, but it's not so apparent. It's just more of a, a color or uh, use it as EQ, even though it's still distortion. It's just so low in there. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, that was them uh, and their sounds. Did you just say sans amp on the kick drum? Oh, yeah. Can, can almost you, every, can you describe almost that every to record. Me? I've never done that. Sans amp on the kick drum. Oh yeah, you'd love it. Uh, just uh, off an aux send, send to, you know, I, I prefer the Sans Amp Classic, but I mean, you can use the PS1. I do it on, with the PS1, but you have to uh, sometimes address some phase issues within Pro Tools, but you could do that with a delay or nudge. Um, but yes, yeah, um, send your kick drum with, off, a, off a bus to the Sans Amp and Bring it in. Make sure you have a, a filter or an EQ of some sort on the Sans Amp so you can play with phase and uh, high pass because it, it really you can, you can change the pitch of the kick drum. Um, you can absolutely change the character of it or you can uh, radically or you can be more subtle with it and just use it as an EQ or sort of like an exciter. Um, all sorts of stuff uh, you can do with it. I, it's, it's probably... It's one of my biggest tools, a sans amp on kick, snare, bass. Yeah. I haven't used the bass amp in 20 years. It's always, I, I, I usually get rid of the amp and, and put a sans amp on the DI, and that's my bass sound. Uh oh, that could be the headline for today the there, Chad. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Chad, um, I, don't, I don't want to put any pressure on you, but let's do a little philosophy, philosophizing. Mm -hmm. And um, in 05, you said that, um, that, that, that you were expecting a, a tornado of new creativity to come down the pike in the audio world. Uh, can you give me an update on that prediction? Has it happened? Are, are we still a little closer? Or have we gotten farther away? What's your take on that? Because I, I felt the same way in the mid-2000s. Well, I, you know something? In, uh, I, th I think... I don't remember that quote exactly, but I think what I was talking about on that quote was I was, I was talking more about the business, that the business got really depressed, and um, that, I mean, there's a whole world out there that's a market uh, that is untapped, and um, eventually it will get tapped, you know, the millions and billions of people that are out there that aren't in America or Europe, um, and the, someday they'll find a way to uh, make money from all those people. So I think I was looking, at, uh, I was looking at, at that, but I was also talking about the creativity. I, I think it's pretty big time. Um, it's just where you look for it. Uh, for me, the rock and roll is, which is what I grew up listening to, or you know, Hendrix and um, back in those days in the 70s. And, um, it was, what I like about the 60s, us, all us, old timers like about the 60s, is it, it was very experimental and you could hear all these different kinds of bands on the radio. I mean, Crosby, Stills and Nash had a hit at the same time as, you know, Jimi Hendrix and Led Zeppelin. Uh, that's pretty crazy, you know, it's, that's wonderful. Uh, it really kept our heads spinning, uh, besides the drugs. But um, <laughs> the, nowadays, uh, nowadays, um, I, I look elsewhere for that uh, inspiration and for me it comes from Rap music. I just think what they're doing is w is what the '60s was doing. They're pushing the envelope on um, sound uh, arrangements are just crazy. <laughs> it's like I, I, they freak me out. They're so good. Some of these arrangements. Uh, uh, so that's I look to those records for my inspiration. When you when you look at those records, Chad, are you looking? from the artist's perspective, from the producer's perspective, and who are some of the folks that you admire in that particular space? Um, there's, uh, well, there's a lot. I, the, the record that I, you know, all the guys that come here, 
to the seminar, I, um, I usually tell them that I, th I think a really good thing for them to do would be go into the studio that they like the sound of and sit down and listen to Super Duper Fly, which is uh, Missy Elliott's very first record. Um, at least it was the first record that I was aware of. And I just think that, that um, it's about as perfect as you can get uh, to me. The sounds are stunning. The arrangements are outrageous. And you can start it at the top and just, you know, it takes you away right to the end. I think it's phenomenal. Um, uh, there's, um, you know, the D'Angelo Voodoo. There's, um, you know, the, there's so much inspiration out there. I just heard something today. Um, one of the participants uh, did, uh, uh, I think, a fair amount of the new Beyoncé record. I hadn't heard the Beyoncé record, but he was playing some of it for me here today, and uh, that, uh, that freaked me out a bit. It was, uh, I don't know if I've ever heard low end like that. It was bloody, it was bloody good, <laughs> I'll tell you. So I, think, I, I don't think we're starved for, I don't think we're starved for inspiration. It's out there. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I know that... Um I sort of, I think when we first started the show, I was a little disillusioned with the music and where the music business was. It was affecting my ability to just enjoy music. And I've noticed in the last year, a couple of years, there's so much innovation. And, and I love the innovation on the production side. And it crosses all kinds of boundaries that didn't cross. And there's all kinds of hybrids and stuff. I, I find it really exciting. Do you, do you find this time period exciting musically? Absolutely. I really do. Yeah, and I, I love the, uh, you know, the, the the bandwidth just keeps increasing on on what you're playing. I, I know people are listening to MP3s, but gosh, I, I send out MP3s for people to listen to my mixes to make decisions on, and they're doing it, and it's actually working. So I don't I, I don't really have the the beef of, of with all that stuff. I I don't mind the you know if you, I I send out the higher bandwidth MP3s like two two fifty six. Um, so, you know, that sounds pretty good to me. I, I, I have to agree with that, too. One of the things that, that I, I, f I felt kind of um, that we had a little bit of a kindred spirit was sometimes I find myself enjoying the process uh, as, m as much as the equipment. The, the, the physical doing it just gets to be so much fun. Sometimes you don't want the mix to end. I can't say that in front of her, but... Um, Damn. <laughs> Make a note. You feel that way too, don't you? It feels, when I hear your work, it sure feels like the process is as much fun as the end result. Yeah, I, I have a lot of rough days where I, I might get into my studio and, and I don't, like, I don't catch my wave. I don't, I don't get in there. I just flick faders around. I try to get something. I think I'm the worst mixer that's ever come around and it's just sounding so awful. I'll, you know, put something else on. I'll go outside, walk the dogs, or, uh, you know, go feed the animals, and uh, I'll come back in, and the clear, my head will be cleared, and, and then maybe I'll sit down, and then two hours will pass, and I won't even notice. And I'll sit back, and I'll listen to the mix, and I'll think, wow, man, okay, I'm on a roll here. I'll just keep working. You know, it's, this is sounding good. One of the, um, I think one of the things that we always stress to our audience, because our audience is so broad, and sometimes it's pros, and sometimes it's learners and enthusiasts, is that sometimes getting away from it will help you deal yeah. with it better. Yeah. Like it's not just grinding it out each time. You, you have yeah. to take a break. Sometimes you have to let your ears rest, clear your head, get your day's problems out of you, and allow creativity back in. A, a lot of my friends use those moments when the creativity is like hiding a little bit to load up a new plug and read a manual, <laughs> heaven forbid. And um, <laughs> you're right, Chad. Yeah. Manuals, yeah, but, uh, manuals. Mitchell, I, uh, I'm a professional. I shouldn't have to read a manual. It should be designed for me to already know how to use somebody it. Somebody should read yeah. it for you. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was another good thing in the studio that Mitchell was very good at, is he, he didn't like working more than eight hours a day. And uh, a lot of times, four of those hours were sitting around talking, shooting the shit, eating food. Um, and I find those, if, when you're collaborating with, other, with musicians and people, sitting around in the lounge or in the studio and really not focusing on the music all the time, I think it's really important. And then you go in and maybe have two, a two-hour burst that you get what a lot of people would take three days to get. We, um, we recently, uh, toward the end of last year, went down to Nashville and spent a week. 
and we've kept up a bunch of relationships there. And they they clearly, for certainly for session musicians and some other folks, they have it down to a work time period. It is from mm. in the morning to six, maybe do three sessions in that time, lunch, call the day for dinner, get home with the family, and stay balanced that way. And they tend to put out great stuff in very efficient ways, and people know when to bring it. They know they have a break. I think it's it's. it's I, I don't own a watch. That's a little restrictive for me. No, I know, but it, you know, <laughs> just as a community, that's. I like what they do, though. I, I respect that a lot. But some the structure helps helps them out. A bunch Absolutely. Of hey, Chad. Uh, first of all, Grammys for two best engineered records. That's that's uh, that's a goal I have not achieved yet. Uh, congratulations on that. And then you also won a couple of Grammys for the Black Keys records that you did. Mm -hmm. Those records are, are very special to me. I, I decided not to kind of analyze them or break them down because I like the mythology and, and I don't want to know a lot about them. Have you got something you can share with us about the process that you found a lot of people seem interested in? Um, well, I'm brothers. Um, uh, it, the process was, it was, a real collaboration over the internet. I mean, we didn't do any streaming, live streaming, anything like that, but it was, um, they had recorded the record one way, uh, and the rough mixes I got were all in mono and really sort of R&B-ish, uh, but really good. Um, and they had decided that they wanted to uh, expand the sound, more stereo, deeper bass, um, get more of uh, like a hip hop, like sonic sensibility. Not try to make the record hip hop, obviously, but just sonically extend those things um, a, a bit. Uh, not as much as a hip hop record, but still bring it into the modern world a bit. So, and they'd recorded it on most of the songs were only eight tracks a kick drum, an overhead, that was the drums, um, and a bass, a guitar, a couple of vocals, maybe a keyboard. Um, so it took some back and forth working with the band, and what was great about them is that I'd, I'd be, I was really timid because you know I don't usually getting people usually get people telling me to just go crazy, have it, have the do whatever you want to do. Uh, it doesn't happen that often, uh, and they just kept saying, um, I don't know, can you go farther? Can't you go farther? What's uh, more? Do more. You know? <laughs> and after about three three back and forth uh, three rounds of, of mixes. Um, I finally started getting wh where they were at, and um, and we hit on something. It was Everlasting Light was the first song I did, and we just uh, uh, just had a day where I went, okay, I'm not going to think about anything else. I'm just going to do exactly what I want to do, and it was and that was it, and that's how we went about the rest of the record. But they they really pushed me on it because I I can be quite timid sometimes. You know you know the engineering code. When you only have eight tracks and a great client, you only charge half price. You did that right. Oh, yeah. yeah. Of course. I did. Just, <laughs> just check. Just of check. course. <laughs> <laughs> All right, David. Um, <clears throat> let's go to the sports world. Okay. You got your arm loose? Uh, man, it's pointless. He's going to clean my clock. Well, and and see, he's deceptive a because good. he lays back so much, yeah. and then you hear the crack of the bat. No, he's going to kill me, so, but I'm going to go anyway. So, Chad, you ready for batter's box? Okay. All right. <laughs> David, fire away. Vocals. Uh, LA3A. Guitars. Sounds out. Overheads. Uh, Omnipressor. Uh, okay, I got you because you're going to say Coles, I know. Uh, <laughs> oh, I forgot to tell everybody, we have a special batter's box. We have, <laughs> we have imposed on Chad the rule that he can't use anything with Neve, anything with uh, Neumann, or any Coles. References. So. Chad, he's he's taking care of international rules just because you're <laughs> you're in France. Yeah, yeah. And if you were here, we'd have you protected. So I apologize <laughs> yeah. for that. And well, I'm just, I'm just trying to stick to the other rule of, of going with the plugins. I am talking about plugins here when I say these. Uh, my friend, anything you want to say? <laughs> reverb. Um. Why? <laughs> <laughs> I quit. That's Game exactly. over. Exactly. I'm done. The answer, I'm, I mean, that's the batter's box answer all of right. all time. All right. <laughs> I'm done. Well, see there. Okay, I'm going to play it to the end just because I'm a good host and, and I went to the Charlie Rose School of Interviewing. Uh -huh. um, snare. Sans Ant. Island gear. If you were stranded on an island, what piece of gear would you want? 
uh, besides having a microphone and all that kind of stuff, that just, yeah, Sans Amp. Okay. A uh, bass. Um, Sans Amp. The cheapest gear uh, that was on a hit that you mixed. Oh, oh, um, a hit. What, uh, I, I don't have that many hits. What, uh, <laughs> a popular record. Okay, um, uh, Level Lock. Sure, Level Lock. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, there's a headline. Let me write that down. Five dollars bought at a garage sale. Oh, wow. Uh, stereo bus. And be honest. Uh, stereo, stereo bus, um, McDSP. Judges, they had a, they had a thing that, that registered your voice tone to see if you were telling the truth. Judges, okay, we got it. <laughs> <laughs> Favorite guitar pedal? Uh, Univibe. Oh, Robin Trower Univibe? Jimi Hendrix Univibe. Gotcha. Ah. Synth. Uh, uh, profit. Oh, five or ten? Five. Good answer. I quit. Um, it's the first batter's box where we had a uh, lie detector test. <laughs> <in the middle. laughs> I said, Blake, you know, he's 50. Well, yeah, you need it with this face, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Great job. Well, let, let's, let's move over to our live folks. John Gork, over in the corner office, welcome. Welcome. How are you guys? How are you? Doing pretty good. We got some good questions today. Good. Why don't we uh, fire away from Mr. Blake? Sounds good. This first one's from Michelle Bell. Could you elaborate on your use of level lock on drums and how exactly you use it in your mixes? Um, it, uh, it, it's easier to show, of course, but I, level locks, they all react quite differently, so it'd be hard uh, for me to tell you, but I, it's, it's additive. Um, uh, a, a real level lock, you would use at mic level. Um, so I end up using uh, the Sound Toys Devil Lock these days, or uh, even Tide Omnipressor as my level lock. And it's uh, it's something I send to on an aux send, and get a nice crunchy distorted sound and add it into the drums. Mm. I was going to ask you about the the Devil Lock from Sound Toys because I use that a lot too. John Gorn, uh, Michael Mil uh, Milterson. What's your philosophy when placing things in the stereo, uh, stereo spectrum of a mix? Uh, you know, uh, I want to go wide. Wide, t wide, high, and, and low. That's what I want. <laughs> <laughs> Good answer. Sean Gordon, another one. Amus, uh, to know you. During your mixing process, will you get the instrumental first, then mix in the vocal, or do you mix around the vocal? I mix around the vocal. Hmm, cool. Sean Gordon, another uh, Luke Pickering, were there any hurdles you had to overcome uh, working with Pearl Jam, considering they previously only worked with one producer? Uh, hurdles. Um, I think the uh, the the biggest hurdle was for me was I'm I'm really pretty um, laid back in the studio. I like my time just sitting about, and I, so do they actually. And they, they, need, they needed more of somebody who could uh, really get them going and playing and, and you know, uh, 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 crack the whip. And I'm not a whip cracker. So that was the, I think that was my biggest, biggest hurdle. But as far as sounds and working on, I think, you know, everybody was cool. We, we, we got along fine. Oh, very cool. Well, Chad must tell you that... Chongor had some great questions He today. did. <laughs> Chongor, Chongor's been on his game. And the audience has been waiting for Chad for so long that they just sent in good stuff. I led the charge. Uh, they, you probably put in those questions under <laughs> pseudonyms. <laughs> you actually, know what? Actually, How'd you know that? I know, because I know you. The Leon Pendergrast. Chad, got, got to tell you, we are so happy to have had you. Thank you for carving out the time. Um, our audience has wanted it, and my partner and, and co-host has wanted it maybe more than our audience, correct? <laughs> yeah, I like his records a lot. And what was really funny is that as we, Victor and I were talking about putting this together, and I would give Dave updates, Dave would go, yeah, I arranged that. Yeah, I put that together. <laughs> yeah, it was, <laughs> this was a very personal thing with Dave, Chad. So, um, Me and Victor, we worked like this. Now, and we love Victor. We love what Mix with the Masters does. Chad, you have an open forum here anytime. Yes. We'd love to have you. Yes. If you're in L.A. in June, we'd love to have you as part of our awards show. But we are 
big fans and thank you for your support. Uh, thank you. Uh, we're going to have you back, so you know, don't get irritated if, if you feel Pensado's place poking you in the, in, in the leg. That's us saying, <laughs> hey, want to come back? Come back on. Uh, you hesitate on that poking thing. No, you got to come to my place sometime. Oh, we'd love to. In Wales? Yeah. yeah. Oh, we'd love to. We'd love to come over and do something from there. That'd be fabulous. Come um, have a good cup of We got a nice cup of coffee. I'll, I'll do you a barbecue, and uh, you can go for some nice walks. <laughs> you can go walk the dog. You can walk the horses, whatever you want to do. John Gore, book, book United right now, please. Thank you. <laughs> okay, cool. There's, there's no barbecue in England. <laughs> there is at my house. Exactly. Okay, all Remember, right. He spent time in L.A. He's, Texas. He's, he's, that's the Texas side. There we go. I, I, barbecue four, I barbecue four times a week. <laughs> <laughs> David, take us home. First of all, I want to say thanks to Ch Chad Blake. He, he didn't have to share all these things, and he did, and I appreciate that. Guys, uh, my favorite types of records and my favorite types of engineers and engineering are the ones where I, when I finally meet the person, they sound like their records, and, and that's because they put their heart, their soul, their passion into everything they do, and they do it so thoroughly and convincingly that you know them through their records. And, and today we saw a prime example of, of a cat that's, that's everything that you hear in his records. Mm -hmm. We'll see you next time. See you, Victor, mixed with the masters, yay! <laughs>